it's nowadays it's a it's a system for video conferencing uh, based on WebRTC. So uh, clients are just browsers. It works. We have uh, most of the features that you've come to expect from other similar applications. So it's a multi-party video conference. Um, we also have mobile clients and uh, most of the components with one or two notable exceptions are open source. So the system can be uh, deployed in your network. And we have all the tools available so you can actually deploy it in production so that it can be scaled and distributed amongst um, multiple servers. We do run the public service at meet.jit.si. This is the free to use service run by the 8x8 team. You can use it at this address. Uh, all you need to do is go there, share the URL with, with someone, and, um, and you're in the same conference. That's one of the distinguishing features that we have, that joining a conference should be as easy as possible. So at the heart of the system, is the Jitsi Video Bridge Selective Forwarding Unit. This is a server which all of the clients connect to and it routes video between them. Uh, it does, it's, a, it's not an MCU, it does not do any transcoding. It pretty much just forwards packets. Um, so the normal way that you would deploy such a system in production as you would uh, choose a set of regions in different geographic locations uh, and have groups of servers there so that users can connect to a server nearby. But we have this problem where when Alice and Bob want to talk to each other and Alice is, for example, in Australia while Bob is in the US, we need to select a server for them somewhere um, the obvious choice is to select it near one of the users. For example, we put the server in Sydney, but then if Charlie joins in the, from the US, we have this problem. Uh, and there's actually two separate problems here. One is that since the connection from Bob to Charlie goes through Sydney, the round trip time is very long between the two endpoints. Uh, it could be as, as much as six or 800 milliseconds, which uh, which is bad for a real-time conference. Uh, the second problem is a little more subtle, which is that um, the round trip time from Charlie and Bob to their server uh, is long. And this has effects on stream repair. So when packets are lost, they need to be retransmitted. If retransmissions arrive late because the round trip time is long, um, the endpoints need to grow their jitter buffer further, so the delay increases even more. So one way we could solve this problem in this scenario is if we just choose a different location for the server. So if we put the server in the US, the two problems pretty much disappear. Um, the connection from Bob to Alice uh, has to go through um, through the ocean, uh, it, it is necessarily, we cannot avoid having this long round trip, uh, but we avoided the long, long round trip between Bob and Charlie. Um, there's two problems with this though. One is that we didn't know that Charlie was going to join when you selected the server initially. And the second one is that someone else might join. For example, if Dana joins in Australia again, we're back with the same problem, this time between um, Alice and Dana. So in order to solve this, uh, one approach is to use cascaded SFUs. So instead of one SFU, we use a set, in this case two, uh, and we interconnect them together. This solves the problem because 
the connection between Charlie and Bob only goes through the US. Uh, so the second problem because uh, every user is connected to a nearby server. So we decided to implement this in Jitsi. Uh, and in our case, we had an advantage because from the start, our signaling server and our um, SFU were separate entities. So we have, um, we have two clients here on the left and right. Uh, and initially they connect to a signaling server, it's called Jikofo, which manages the conference. Um, and they connect, they then, um, the server, Jikofo, selects which SFU to use, um, and then the clients connect there, and that's the server used for media. Now, if the round trip time or the bandwidth to the signaling server is long, that is not that bad, as long as the media connection is, uh, is good. So all we needed to do to make this work was to make the signaling server aware of the multiple SFUs in the conference and interconnect the SFUs. Uh, we did not need to do any um, shared state between the SFUs or something like that because we already have the central entity. So this is what we did. Uh, we code the system Octo. Um, implementing this required no changes to the clients. Uh, as long as far as they're aware, they're just connecting to an SFU and they receive the same streams as usual. We needed to extend the Colibri protocol, that's the XMPT extension we use to communicate between um, our signaling server and the SFUs. And obviously we needed to extend the SFUs to support talking to each other. Um, the way we designed this was at least for the initial version to use a full mesh between the SFUs. So we support um, any number of SFUs. Uh, in practice, this doesn't grow to more than four or five, so it's feasible to connect them in a full mesh. So um, this also makes SFU selection easy because all that the signaling server needs to do is select a server that is near the user and added to the conference. Um, on the wire, we had to transport RTP, RTCP, as well as um, what in WebRTC normally travels over data channels uh, between the SFUs. So we decided to encapsulate all this in this fixed size header. Uh, just because this was a simple solution um, and because we we wanted to keep the options open to later change the topology and use um, a tree of servers instead of a full mesh. Uh, so having this simple fixed size header prepended to all packets uh, makes this easier. Uh, as opposed to using, for example, an RTP header extension. Um, the header is very simple. It has a field that identifies the conference, another field that identifies the endpoint, um, and then some fields for media type so that we can encode, um, so that we know that whether the packet is uh, audio, video, or uh, data. So, we deployed this on Mi Jitsi. Uh, Mi Jitsi is currently deployed in seven regions in AWS. If you open a conference, you should be able to see the server count and where each participant is connected to. Uh, and this was late last year uh, when we finally enabled it. So that's all for the cephalopods. And now I'm moving on to the second part, which is about the new version of Jitsi Video Bridge. So I'm going to talk about mammals instead. A little aside, um, in humans, there's two nerves that serve the larynx. Um, there's a superior laryngeal nerve, 
in green here, and it stems from the cortex and pretty much connects directly to the larynx. But there's also this other nerve called the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. There's also a right one, not visible here. So it travels with the vagus nerve, then it branches off, loops around the aorta, and then goes back up to the larynx, which is quite a detour. And it's not obviously why it's happened this way. Presumably some of our ancestors had a different morphology, so the detour wasn't that big. I'll come back to this later. So a little history of Jitsi. Um, Emil Evo started the project, then called SIP Communicator, in 2003. Um, it was originally the soft phone, uh, written in Java, with a swing UI. It ran on uh, PC and Linux and Mac. It supported SIP and XMPP and all kinds of other protocols. I think it had H323 support, ICQ, all kinds of things. Around 2009, um, they added multi-party call support. And that was really cool. You could have cross-protocol cross, ah, cross calls. You could have one endpoint connected to SIP, uh, merging a call to someone over XMPP. Um, and the way this worked was the client, one of the clients acted as a focus, organized everything, gathered all the streams together, mixed all the audio, forwarded it, forwarded all the video. And that was really cool, but there was a problem with the limited upstream bandwidth of clients. So in around 2011, um, we decided to move this code away and put it on a server somewhere. We just needed to design a protocol so that the client controls the server, and the server is going to handle all the media for the conference. And we did this, and that was how Jitsi Video Bridge was born. So at this point, it's kind of branching off of a nerve somewhere and going in a different direction. And then in um, 2012, WebRTC started to uh, develop. And we decided to add support for WebRTC. So we had to do ICE and DTLS. We had to add data channels. We had to do bandwidth estimation. Um, we did simulcast, and finally we did Octo. We added all these features on top of this thing that started as a desktop client. So in a way, we built a giraffe. And it's a really good giraffe. It works well. Uh, it can reach the high branches up in WebRTC. Um, and it's adapted to it, its environment. But it has the same nerve traveling from the brain down, looping around the aorta and back up. And now the detour is larger and larger. So all I'm saying here is uh, we've had a lot of technical depth in the project. Uh, and there's two main problems here, at least two of them that we ran into in practice. One is that it's hard to maintain. Uh, we found this out. One, one specific story where we found this out was last year when um, Chrome announced that they're going to deprecate support for DTLS 1.0. Uh, someone said, okay, let's update it. And then someone spent a week trying to update it to 1.2 and it, they couldn't really make it work in a week. Uh, so as it is now, we have it working in the new version but not in the old version. And the second part, the second problem is that uh, we know that performance can be much better. It's pretty good as, it, good as it is, but it can be better. But we cannot improve it because of this way that things work. This diagram is um, the transformer chain. So the chain of handlers that packets pass through. Uh, this way when we receive a packet, and this way when we send it. And it's 
hard to maintain. And we had two of these, one for audio, one for video. Uh, it was just hard to maintain. So we decided that it's time to do a major surgery. Uh, we had these um, These are the things that we ended up doing. First, we removed a lot of deprecated code from the bridge itself. Second, we replaced the main library that we used. Uh, we had libjitsy, which was a spin-off again from the desktop client. Uh, and it's a huge library that does a lot of things that we don't need for this use case. Uh, we redesigned the internals because um, the old versions did not really make much sense. They were uh, modeled over the way Jingo represents things. So we have contents. We have one content for audio, one content for video, uh, and channels inside of that. So we could have an audio channel and a video channel, and they just happen to have an endpoint. With the new design, the endpoint is the important abstraction, and it happens to have um, audio and video streams attached. We redesigned the threading model with the previous threading model. Because of this library, we had to have, for each single endpoint, four different threads reading from the same socket. So it's one for audio, one for video, and uh, they split in RTP, RTCP. So we completely redesigned this. Uh, we kept the Calibra interface. That's the XMPP or REST interface uh, that is used to control the SFU. So we use it from our own GCOFO application, but other people use it via REST. So there's multiple users of a video bridge, and we wanted to maintain that interface as it is. Uh, we did so by keeping a thin layer to translate between the old style messages and the new style architecture. So in the end, uh, we replaced libjitsy, which is around 200,000 lines of code, most of them not used here, with two new libraries. Um, the total lines of code dropped significantly. So we lost something about 200,000 lines of code. And I'll go to the specific about the libraries. Um, since our application is really in Java, but, uh, but we're not necessarily excited about writing code in Java, we decided to use Kotlin here and see if we can make things better this way. The experiment worked pretty well, and we're happy with the results so far. Um, we do use uh, both using Kotlin code from Java and vice versa. So the first library is just a basic RTP, RTCP parsing library. It's pretty generic, uh, and it's designed to be efficient for our case. It's something like 6,000 lines of code. It's already available in GitHub. So if you need an RTP library, go ahead and try it out, see if that works for you. Um, the usage is pretty simple. You can parse a packet. You can access the fields. It's always backed by a buffer. Uh, it has support for RTP extensions, which is a little bit tricky. Um, but it's done this way for the sake of performance. We had to write this part three times to get it right. And we ended up doing something very similar to what we had originally. But at least the code is cleaner now. The second library is called Jitsi Media Transform. It's available on this address, again on GitHub. Um, it's an RTP processing pipeline. So there's three levels of abstractions that could be useful. Um, the reason for this library is for video bridge to work. That's the main reason. But I think some of the components might still be useful. So if you need something like this, take a look and see if you can use any of, of it. 
Uh, the highest level of abstraction is the transceiver. Uh, this is meant to represent the connection to an endpoint. So you can do things like declare the payload types in the session for this endpoint, declare that this endpoint um, owns this SSRC, add a simulcast SSRC, things like this, tell the library to notify you of events. Example events are reading audio levels off of audio packets or um, the bandwidth estimation changing. Um, we have this too, or the way it works is you can feed it packets you receive from the network and it's going to um, handle the packet, update its internal state, do bandwidth estimation and so on, and then give you back a parse packet in this incoming packet handler. Uh, on the other side, if you want to send a packet to this endpoint, you can call send packet, it's going to do its magic, and then call your uh, send packet handler. Uh, the other layer of, of abstraction that this can be used with is um, by the node tree. Uh, so we replace that diagram that I showed you with a tree lo that looks something like this. Uh, that's something that often needs to happen at um, RTP applications. Packets need to be demuxed and handled as RTP or RTCP. They go through a chain of transformations and at some point they get split up again for audio and video, for example. Uh, we implement this with this um, tree of nodes. Each node can process a packet, and this is a simplified version of what we actually have in the bridge. So here we define a demuxer for RTP, RTCP. We select which packets go down this path, we have RTP parsing, decrypting SRTP statistics, then we split down for audio and video, and so on. So it's pretty simple to use. Finally, the third layer of abstraction is using the nodes themselves. So we have things like um, nodes to process SRTP, SRTCP, to cache packets, to monitor a stream and re uh, request retransmission with NACs if needed, and so on. So they, so they could be used by themselves. So one of the things that I mentioned is motivation for the rewrite was performance. And we still haven't finished with all the performance things that we want. Uh, right now we are trying to get the code to work in a stable way so we can merge it. But we have been keeping an eye on at least being able to perform optimizations later. Uh, that being said, the way we measure performance is we have um, a standard scenario that runs automatically on a grid. It's a combination of uh, conferences being run. It has 16 participants. Uh, we start with a conference of two um, or eight conferences of two and then they change and they grow to two conferences of eight. Uh, it lasts about 20 minutes. So it's designed to compare um, the performance across the versions of our bridge. Um, we do see an improvement, so, and, w and across the interval of 20 minutes or so, we measured the average CPU and the average uh, throughput. And our final metric is the megabits per percent CPU. So if we take um, master as a reference, the current version, we, we see something between 39 and 49 percent, depending on uh, configuration. That's our gain so far. So we're pretty happy with this, but we also know about some more low-hanging fruit that we can reach 
afterwards, after we do the merge. A uh, few words about garbage collection. We found that since everything we have runs on the JVM, uh, the garbage collector has to pause all the threads to do its job. Uh, and if we run that same test scenario and look at the pauses of the, J of the user threads due to garbage collection, uh, here on the top left we have the current version we see, and this is in seconds, so we see pauses of up to 250 milliseconds or so, which is not great, not great at all. Uh, so we put some work into improving the situation. Uh, we did the same test with the new version and had the results on the top right, which is pretty similar. We then introduced the memory pool in Java, which helped to, um, to make the pauses happen less often, but when they do happen, especially cleaning the old generation, which is red, they are equally as long, so we still see 250 millisecond pauses. Um, it turned out that all we needed to do was to switch the garbage collector the garbage collection algorithm for the JVM. As soon as we switch to the CMS one, which um, offers a trade-off between using some more CPU, uh, but performing some of the tasks in parallel with the application threads, meaning that the pauses can be shorter. With that improvement, we see that the pauses only go up to about 75 milliseconds, which is it's not perfect, but it's much better. Um, what is the current status? I was really hoping that I could show you the merge pull request today, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, we really underestimated their effort here. We've been promising a release for months now. We are very, very close. The libraries are released. They're available on GitHub and on our Maven repo. Uh, the new version of the bridge builds cleanly now. You can try it out if you want. The auto automated pass test pass, it merges cleanly with master. And we have two remaining blockers. One is figuring out some instability with bandwidth estimations. We think that we have it, um, we think that we know wha what is causing it and we hope that to have a fix soon. The second one is figuring out how to do the versions in the Debian package so that we don't break everyone's deployment. After that we can merge and that's all. So thank you very much. Sounds like uh, lots of fascinating improvements, and I know from my time when I was at Dialogic that video is one of the hardest things to do. Um, so congratulations, and so we've got a question from Tori. Uh, so just a question with regards to the garbage collector algorithms. Uh, in the end, you found out that the best improvement was uh, using CMS. Have yes. you checked to see whether you still need to do object pooling, or maybe the object pooling is causing things to go into perm gen prematurely and making things worse? We, we did test that, I don't have it here. Um, with CMS, it's not making things wor worse. Uh, okay. Pooling, so w what we are pooling is those 1500 bytes buffers that we use okay. for packets all the time, nothing else. Uh, we were worried that because we're pulling it, uh, pooling, the perm gen is gonna grow too much and cleaning that is gonna be slow, but we did not observe that with CMS. S so you think you can just get away with dropping the pool altogether or you think you still need it? Uh, we, w it improves things. Okay. Uh, we do have plans to um, long term to perhaps use a pool in native memory and avoid the garbage collection for that entirely. Um, any other questions? 
Oh, oh, up front here. Look, thanks for the great presentation and many years of great work doing things with Jitsi and Jitsi Meet and video. Um, I'm a regular user of Jitsi Meet um, with other free software projects as well. It often helps us collaborate, which is really wonderful. Uh, there's one problem I notice from time to time. Is that sometimes we get two or more people on a call and one or more person appears to be muted, like their audio is muted or it says they're muted and they're not. And they click to unmute themselves and you still can't hear them. And eventually people start restarting their browsers and, and at some point they can be heard. Um, is that a problem on the browser side or on the server side? Will that change with this change of libjitsy? Um, are there any things you could do in um, the service to detect when something like that is wrong and help people, like to help us to find which user has to restart their browser if it is a browser problem? Right. Um, the way you describe the problem, um, my guess would be that it's a problem on the client side. Mm -hmm. We hope that no one notices when we push this thing. So I don't think it's going to solve it. Um, that being said, we do have um, a feature in the client to remind you if you're trying to speak, uh, but you're muted. But, uh, but in order for that to work, it requires access to the microphone. So if you did not initially allow access to your microphone, this doesn't work. Yeah, I, I can confirm the m access has always been allowed. Okay. And after allowing access, say it might be on my side, I see myself muted, I can see that I've granted access, and even if I click to unmute, it just stays muted. Um, no error appears. I haven't ever looked in the JavaScript mm -hmm. console to see if there are errors at that level, but certainly there's no visual error for the normal user to say that it could not unmute them. Um, I'm not aware of us having this as a task or anyone reporting it really. It might be, but uh, I just don't know about it. Um, sounds like a client bug and, uh, and an important one at that. Yeah, we'll discuss it later. Okay, yeah. yeah. And now, one last question. No, o over here? Okay. Oh, okay. Hi, Bruce. Uh, you mentioned the REST interface. Is, mm -hmm. there, is there any plan to extend it, for example, to support Okta protocol, or still is going to mean like it is right now? Um, extending it to support the rest of the features that we've added should be trivial. It's just translating JSON to XML. Uh, we, our team doesn't have a plan to do this right now, but contributions would be welcome. Thank you. So I have one quick question for you. So I know uh, as new codecs come out, sometimes it creates havoc within the conferencing platforms, mm -hmm. right? Because one browser supports a new codec, et cetera. H how, do you, how do you integrate these new coders and in, in new codecs into your uh, solution? I'd be curious as to how do you so go about that? If you look at the system in, in Hull, it's quite a complex problem, and we don't really have a solution. Uh, right now, we only use VP8, uh, with the exception of peer-to-peer -peer calls, where um, uh, it's either VP8 or H264, based on what the client support. Uh, for the server, though, it's pretty simple, because uh, it only cares about certain, a few bits of information about each packet. Right now, we read them off of the VP8 headers, but uh, as soon as browsers and implement uh, standardized frame marking extensions, we can be codec agnostic. Uh, it's a relatively small change, but we have not implemented it yet. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's give Boris a big round of applause. Thank you very much. And a quick reminder, next up is lunch. We're back down in the main house and uh, have a, hope you have a wonderful lunch and come on back up here for the afternoon sessions.